A very important message has been repeated time and time again over the course of centuries. Do not go out in the woods alone. One of the main mechanisms of folklore is to teach a lesson that often can mean life or death. One reoccurring lesson that I often see is to stop children from going deep into the forest. Not until very recently, a parent didn't have a way to contact their children if they were to wander off and get into danger. If a child went into the woods alone, especially at night, the likelihood is pretty high that the child would never be seen again. From getting lost, to getting hunted by dangerous animals, to succumbing to the elements. Because of this, parents needed a way to discourage their children from running off, and this is where we talk about the chilling story of the huntress from Dead by Daylight and how she and the Baba Yaga are the epitome of this lesson. Hello, my name is Crypto Kitten, and on my channel, we talk about the magical, the mythical, and the macabre in folklore, mythology, and the media. Let's start with the Huntress. I believe her story is both terrifying and tragic. It reminds me that not all villains are born evil. The Huntress is a playable character in the multiplayer survival game Dead by Daylight. Dead by Daylight was developed and published by the Canadian studio Behavior Interactive in 2016. It is a 1v4 game where there's one killer and four survivors and the killer has to stop the survivors from fixing generators that open a gate to escape the entity. The killer must also capture survivors and impale them on hooks as a sacrifice to the entity. Survivors and killers each use up to four perks in their loadout that give them special abilities and each character starts with three that are unique to them. And more perks and add-ons can be unlocked through the blood web as you level up. According to Villains Wiki, the entity is an ancient otherworldly creature responsible for plucking the survivors and the killers from their perspective world and bringing them into its realm so it can feed off of their emotions. And yeah, I feel like if you were an ancient otherworldly being and needed to feed on emotions to survive, infinitely making random people fear for their lives while being chased by terrifying killers is honestly such a good idea. I think that's some big brain energy. The way killers get put into this twisted game is the entity scouts for people it believes would make amazing sadistic murderers. And Anna, aka the Huntress, was one of those people. The Huntress was brought into the game during Chapter 5, A Lullaby for the Dark, a free DLC released on July 27, 2017. She's a ranged killer throwing hunting hatches at her prey while humming an eerie lullaby. I'm sure she's having a great time hunting down her prey because it's what she does best even before joining the entity's game. Her personal perks are Beast of Prey, Territorial Imperative, and Hex Huntress Lullaby. Beast of Prey grants the undetectable status effect that suppresses the terror radius for as long as Bloodlust is active, which causes killers to walk faster during long chases. Territorial Imperative allows the auras of the survivors to be shown to you and the Hex Huntress Lullaby makes it to where when a survivor fails a repair skill check, it instantly regresses the generator 2, 4, or 6% depending on the tier and does the same for healing skill checks. All of these perks allow the Huntress to be a fierce killing machine with better map awareness and enhanced chasing abilities. Now let's talk about why the Huntress was chosen by the entity. To do that, we must go back to her childhood. At a young age, Anna was taught by her mother how to survive the harsh, solitary life in the northern woods of Russia. Being in this type of environment meant you needed grit, resilience, and the skill to survive not only everyday life, but also in case something horribly wrong inevitably happened. The mother and daughter would return to their cabin as soon as daylight fell and would lie close to the hearth for warmth from the outside's chilling temperature. And she would rest in her mother's arms surrounded by wooden toys and masks her mom crafted for her. Anna drifted to sleep with stories and lullabies and dreamt happy dreams. But the next day, a horrible event changed everything. Due to running low on food during a particularly brutal winter, they decided to go after a great elk. This was risky business, but they had no other choice if they wanted to survive the winter. However, upon stalking the giant elk, without warning, the elk charged at Anna. Paralyzed with fear, she stood still as the beast got closer and closer, seeing the murderous fury in its eyes. Before she knew it, her mother threw herself in its path with an axe in her hand. Then a blood-curdling scream was heard while the elk impaired her with his antlers and hoisted her into the air, but with what was left of her strength, she struck the elk's head over and over while it tried to shake her loose from its antlers. Then, with a sickening crack, the antler snapped, and his mother was free, and the beast collapsed. Anna being so young and so small was unable to move her mother's broken body, so she sat with her where she had fallen. To distract her from the dying elk's cries, Anna's mother held her and hummed her favorite lullaby. After a while, the sounds of the elk and her mother grew quieter and her body grew colder. Once the forest became completely silent, she eventually stood up and started her long walk home. 
Having been taught the ways of living in the forest, she followed her instincts and became one with the wild. As she got older, she became a dangerous predator, getting stronger and perfecting her hunt. But the more time went on, the more animalistic and less human she became. She would widen her territory and start to be able to master the hunt of bigger, more dangerous prey, starting from squirrels, hares, and foxes to wolves and bears. But as unsuspecting travelers came through her woods, she discovered that humans were what she really enjoyed hunting. Whoever stepped into her territory was ultimately slaughtered, and she liked to collect their tools, clothes, and especially toys when her prey happened to be children. However, she always spared the little girls, the girls she would take back to her cabin deep into the woods. Looking at these young girls would awaken and nurture her motherly instincts. To protect her daughters, she would tie them up by their necks with rough and chafing rope fastened firmly to the wall so that they wouldn't wander off and die because every time one would go outside, they would succumb to the cold, starvation, or sickness. And every time this would happen, it would push her deeper into pain, sadness, and madness. Eventually, she started to raid nearby villages and slaughter whole families to kidnap their daughters. To calm the frightened children, she would wear one of the animal masks her mother had made for her many years ago. Over time, Anna became a malevolent legend among the villagers, calling her the huntress who killed men and ate little girls. War eventually came to the forest and German soldiers began to pass through while marching to attack the collapsing Russian Empire. Because of this, there were no travelers, the villages abandoned their homes, and there were no little girls to be found, only soldiers. Many of them would end up being found with violent axe wounds and whole groups would mysteriously disappear. And once the war was over, the rumors of the Huntress disappeared with it. The story of the Huntress is both simple and complicated. On the surface is the origin story of a ruthless killer who became a cautionary folktale. But when you peel back the layers, you start to realize that this is a truly tragic story of a young little girl that lost the only source of guidance and love she had. After the loss of her mother, she had no one to help her through her grief. I can't even fathom losing the only person able to teach me, nurture me, and protect me, and then being alone completely. Just isolated in the forest, at an age I wouldn't even know how to function as a human. There's no way I can imagine anyone growing up normal in that circumstance. Obviously this is fiction and there are people who lose their nurture or never grow up having one that grow up normally. But when you look up the childhoods of many documented serial killers, their childhoods often involve a lack of a nurturing environment and that's basically what Anna is. For Anna, she had to kill animals in order to live. Killing was normal and necessary, and without a role model, she never learned properly what is right and what is wrong. She was also naturally perfecting her hunt, and going from killing animals to killing humans is probably no more than her doing something she genuinely found joy in. Especially because she did it with her mom. And then when she saw the little girls, it sparked something in her. Her motherly instincts kicked in and I'm sure she thought about her mother a lot and possibly wanted to protect the girls the way she felt protected. Without a proper moral compass or understanding of how to properly care for another being, she saw basically what she viewed as her children dying at a devastating rate. And for anyone, that's going to break you. And the way she decided to protect them with the ropes is honestly terrifying and sadistic, but it's all she knew. I also can't even imagine what those girls were feeling. To them, she was truly a monster. They don't know what she went through or how she got there. They can only experience what she became. And when it comes to the villagers, not only were they justified in making the Huntress a fearsome local legend, but I'm sure they didn't even understand the gravity of the situation. The message is pretty clear. Do not go deep into the woods alone. Stay close. And it's scary in their case because their story isn't even exaggerated. They're not just getting lost or being eaten by a predator. They are literally getting captured and are dying. No wonder the entity saw the Huntress as being capable of thriving in its sick game. She was seen as a terrifying being by those near her, and she enjoyed hunting humans as it is. So being part of this game is honestly probably a place she thrives. I also thought it was a great idea to make a character skin highlighting the correlations between the Huntress and the Baba Yaga. When the Huntress wears the ultra-rare Baba Yaga outfit from the Modern Tales collection, it includes special features such as a unique lobby theme song, unique idol animation, a new lullaby with a similar melody to her old one, and a sinister witch voice when attacking survivors. Her mask is very interesting and showcases a major theme with the Baba Yaga in that she embodies duality and the inspiration of my makeup today. 
The Baba Yaga originated in Slavic folklore around the medieval period and was passed down through oral tradition and was mentioned in writing in 1755 by a man named Mikhail V. Lomonosov in his book Russian Grammar. And she is considered one of the most famous Slavic folklore. She is well known as a figure that's either malevolent and sadistic or a guiding light. Her malevolent side tends to be the most known or at least the most represented in modern media and tales. She is known to lure children into the woods to fry and eat them. She is associated with the deep forest and forest wildlife, and her most iconic characteristic is how she travels by flying around in a wooden mortar whilst wielding a pestle, and she uses a broom to wipe away any traces of her tracks. She lives in a hut standing on chicken legs surrounded by a fence topped with human skulls. And you can see her draped over her stove or reclining across her hut with her nose touching the ceiling. In many Slavic languages, Baba means grandmother or old woman, and Yaga is more universally debated, but depending on the region means serpent, shudder, witch, evil woman, disease, and etc. Overall, generally bad vibes. So basically, Baba Yaga means scary old woman. Other characteristics of the Baba Yaga are that she's an ogress, is the guardian of the fountains of the water of life, and often follows death on his travels while devouring souls. He is also said to have two sisters and is considered part of the triple goddess, specifically the crone. Another cool thing about her is that she is sometimes seen as embodying female empowerment and independence because she's a baddie who lives outside of societal norms and lives by her own rules. A story about the Baba Yaga that showcases her ferocious and sadistic tendencies is of a story titled Baba Yaga's Black Geese and was collected in the 19th century by Alexander Afanasyev, who was inspired by the Brothers Grimm to collect and record oral Slavic folktales to ensure their survival. The story was then told by Russian author Alison Lori and made into a picture book in 1999. The story involves a sister Elena and her little brother whose parents were going away to the market. The mother tells the daughter to stay away from the forest and to stay inside because the Baba Yaga has a flock of black geese that go around scouting the area for children wandering in the woods to take them back to her hut for dinner. And as an incentive, she told them they would come back with sugar buns. For a while, they obeyed. However, Elena got bored and heard her friends playing outside. So she went outside and took her brother with her. She sat him down on the ground and ran to go play with her friends. But when she came home, her brother was gone. The black geese have taken her brother to the Baba Yaga. Elena started to look for him everywhere, but to no prevail. She knew it had to be the black geese and ran deep into the forest to find him. On her way there, she hears a fish gasping for water on the outside of its pond and calling for help. Even though she was focused on saving her brother, she decided to help the fish and because of this, the fish gave her a shell and told her if she's ever in danger to throw it over her shoulder. Then she reaches a squirrel whose leg is caught in a trap and is asking for help. She saves the squirrel and it gives her a walnut and tells her to throw it over her shoulder whenever she's in danger. Then she comes by a mouse who couldn't get into his little house because the rock was in front of it. And when she moves the rock out of the way, the mouse hands her a little pebble and told her if she's ever in danger, you guessed it, to throw it over her shoulder. Then she went so deep into the forest that the trees are so dense the sun barely shines. Then she came to a clearing and sees the infamous hut of the Baba Yaga standing on giant chicken legs. As she gets closer, she sees a kettle boiling over a fire, Baba Yaga sleeping, and on the floor was Elena's little brother playing with bones. She goes in to snatch her brother and books it. But this caught the attention of the geese and they started honking to wake up the Baba Yaga. The Baba Yaga started running after them, but Elena wasn't very fast, so Baba Yaga was gaining on them. But then she remembered the shell in her pocket and threw it over her shoulder, and suddenly a broad lake appeared behind her. Don't underestimate the power of a shell, I guess. Because the lake was too large for Baba Yaga to go around, she began drinking the lake, but she drank it so fast she was quickly able to start running again. When Elena looked back and saw Baba Yaga again, she remembered the walnut and threw it over her shoulder, and the giant grove of trees appeared. But the Baba Yaga ate all of them. It gave them a little more of a lead though, so that helps. But the Baba Yaga was fast and got so close that Elena could hear her gnashing teeth and could see her bony arms about to snatch them up. Then Elena threw the pebble over her shoulder and a giant stone mountain appeared and the Baba Yaga couldn't eat it, she couldn't drink it, and couldn't go around it. So the Baba Yaga begrudgingly walked back into the forest growling and cursing. 
And the two came back just in time for her parents to come back home with sugar buns. And even though they disobeyed and got themselves in that situation in the first place, with all the running and terror they were under, they were lucky to be alive. So I think they deserve the sugar buns. The Baba Yaga is relentless, but also terrifyingly powerful. She's literally drinking whole lakes and eating whole forests. And Elena was very lucky in being an empathetic person because they were without a doubt going to be eaten otherwise. It's very justifiable that she is feared by the masses. And it leads me to believe that when Elena and her brother have their own families, that they will perpetuate the cycle of warning their children about the horrors of the woods. But while the Baba Yaga is pretty much always depicted as a disheveled old witch, she isn't always evil and in some ways can be the beacon to a hero's story. One of those stories, and one of the most famous, is Vasilisa the Beautiful and is a Russian fairy tale written by Alexander Afanasyev. This story centers around the daughter of a merchant named Vasilisa. Vasilisa's mother died when she was eight, and on her deathbed, she gave her a doll called a Motinka doll. Her mother told her to always keep this on her and never tell anyone about it, even her own father. And if she was in any danger, needed help, or came across someone with malicious intent, all she had to do was offer it something to eat and drink. The first time that she asked for the help of the doll was when her mother eventually passed away and needed help grieving her loss. After the death, her father decided to remarry, but married a widow who was awful and very cruel to Vasilisa. When her dad wasn't around, her stepmom would make her do copious amounts of grueling and unnecessary chores, but would often call on the help of her doll to help her do the chores. One day her dad went on a long business trip and an absolutely wild thing that the stepmom did was sell their home and move to a home in the woods away from others and I think you know where this is going. She became even worse and isolated the family so Vasilisa couldn't get any help. But there was another evil reason why she moved Vasilisa and her two daughters into the woods. When she wasn't overworking Vasilisa with household chores, she would make her do tasks in the woods so that there was a better chance of being captured and eaten by the Baba Yaga. However, because of her doll, she always came back unharmed and also more and more beautiful. Because of this, her stepmom gave her another task to fetch fire because she purposefully extinguished all the fires except one candle. But it had to be from the Baba Yaga. Vasilisa's doll advised her to go, and so she went. While walking, she saw a man ride by her a few hours before dawn who was dressed in all white and rode a white horse with white riding gear. Then a similar one in all red very peculiar. She eventually came to a house that stood on chicken legs surrounded by a fence made of human bones. A black rider then rode past her and night fell. After that, the eye sockets of the skulls began to glow like lanterns, which actually sounds pretty cool. The Baba Yaga then arrived in her flying mortar and told her that she must perform tasks to earn the fire she was asking for or be killed. She was to clean the house and the yard, wash Baba Yaga's laundry, and cook her a meal enough for a dozen, which she was going to eat all by herself. She was also tasked with separating grains of rotten corn from good corn and separating poppy seeds from grains of soil. Working herself to exhaustion, the doll told her it would finish the tasks and to go to bed. At dawn, the white rider passed. At or before noon, the red one passed. Then, when the black one rode by, the Baba Yaga returned and commanded three pairs of disembodied hands to squeeze oil out of corn and asked Vasilisa if she had any questions. So she asked about the riders and explained that white was day, the sun was red, and black was the night. When she wanted to ask about the hands, the doll quivered in her pocket to signal not to ask that question. Because Vasilisa asked a question, now it was Baba Yaga's turn. The Baba Yaga was very suspicious that Alyssa finished her tasks and asked her how she was able to do it. And she replied, by my mother's blessing. Not wanting anyone blessed in her home, she kicked her out and sent her with the skull lantern full of burning coals. When Vasilisa returned, she found out that her family had been unable to light any candles or fire in their home, and even lamps and candles that were brought in from outside were useless because they would just immediately be snuffed out when they walked in. However, when Vasilisa stepped inside, not only did it not snuff out, it burned her stepmother and her stepsisters to ashes. Then she buried the skull according to its instructions so that no person would be harmed. 
and this is when Vasilisa's life turned for the better. Vasilisa would become an assistant to a maker of cloth in Russia's capital, where she became so skilled at her craft, the Tsar noticed her skill and later married her, making her a Tsarina. One thing that stood out to me is how the Baba Yaga just let Vasilisa walk away. She could have easily eaten her, but let her go, and she became a female monarch. Instead of ruining her life, the Baba Yaga helped her achieve amazing things. And if her stepfamily was still there, she would have most likely stayed their servant and lived a life of being used and hated. It was a very gruesome way to actualize her dreams, but it's the Baba Yaga we're talking about. Another thing that stood out to me is that this reminded me a lot of Cinderella. And with Alexander being very inspired by the Brothers Grimm, it makes sense. These stories raise the question on if the Baba Yaga is truly evil. In one story, she's literally attempting to cook and eat a baby. And in the last story, she leaves a young woman with a horrible home life to a life of success and luxury. The Baba Yaga will always be a figure that speaks on the duality and nuance of good versus evil. And in a way, this reminds me of Anna because Anna had a chance of not becoming who she became. Her mother was very loving and Anna was very happy and would have had a very comfortable life despite the circumstances. But when her mother died, without a role model and nurturer, she truly didn't know better. And when it came to the little girl she captured, she really wanted to protect them in the only way she knew how. To me, the underlying story for Anna is that villains aren't always born evil, sometimes they're made. Despite all of this, the lesson behind the stories remained the same. Whether fictional families or real families, children needed to be warned about the dangers of the wild forests of Russia and that the deeper you go into the forest, the scarier and more brutal it became. Both of these women will remain legends in their communities and the dark echoes of the forest. Thank you guys so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the stories of the Huntress and Baba Yaga. Like the video if you found it interesting and comment if you learned anything new or want to express your thoughts. And remember to keep your minds open and embrace the extraordinary. Thank you.